active session. Parties and council are present. Our jurors are not yet present. Uh, we completed the uh, 402 slash discovery hearing with regard to uh, the uh, people's expert witness on uh, the video. Uh, and then, Mr. McGee, you wanted to be heard on that issue? Yes, sir. The difficulty from a perspective of the defense is, is the people do not have their experts writing reports. Excuse me. And so when they don't write reports, we don't know what they did. And we don't know what they have. And so during this hearing, we learned that the expert did a lot of examination of the different videos. And he made determinations that said, yes, this is totally different. They're all coming out different. Each time he does a mathematical calculation, he gets a different answer. Um, that's important for uh, discovery and for cross-examination. That sounds sculptory. Uh, when he did the wheel-based measurement, and they're coming between, uh, I think it was point or 10.15, uh, 10.71 in distance. That's over a half a foot in difference. We need to know what he's saying that the actual measurement is of the wheelbase for that truck that would be in the video because we know the actual wheelbase as measured by Mike Rupps, who will be testifying. Uh, based on the information he, he gave us, that sounds like it excludes this vehicle. And the fact that uh, he also did other examinations that he deleted because he found them not to be relevant, uh, that's also a huge problem for the defense because this is information, again, we don't have. So they want to call a witness without giving us everything he did, um, all the findings he made, and so we can properly cross-examine him with the help of our expert witness. And so I think he should be excluded. Uh, the difficulty also from the defense is if this was a uh, sheriff's department employee, clearly the people would be, uh, the knowledge of the expert from a sheriff's department would be inferred on the people. That doesn't apply, that I believe to external experts. So this is not a Brady violation, but now that we know it's there, it's incumbent upon the government to go get it. And they have to go get all that information for the defense from an expert that they consulted with. And once they've consulted and they have something that's exculpatory and they know it exists, they have to provide it. Another problem is, as we understand now from the Sporal 2 yesterday, that during the process they're going through this, Dr. Rudin met with uh, one of the district attorneys in this case, told him what his findings were, and we didn't get a report on that. And Roland requires, you cannot avoid giving over discovery by having oral communications. If you do, you must put them down in writing and provide that. So <laughs> we have this first expert witness with no report. We're finding there's all kinds of exculpatory information in there. We have the other ones that are in my motion that didn't write a report. We don't know if there's other information that they did that's going to be exculpatory now. This is the risk of allowing experts to be called without actually producing a report saying, this is the process we took, these are the steps we took, these are the findings we have, and these are the conclusions we made. Even when the court no, questioned, even when the court questioned uh, the witness, uh, you asked him, can you conclude that this is the vehicle? He said, no. Can you exclude it? No. Well, that would be important information for us to have for cross-examination and also relevance. Because if the people want to call witnesses that never write a report, now it's our perspective that you don't have an offer of proof of what he'll say. You don't know if they'll say anything that's relevant to this trial. And they should all just be excluded until you have an idea of what they're actually going to testify to. And if you know, Roland requires you to put it in writing and provide it to the defense. So this is not a trial by ambush, but this is a search for the truth. And that is what the duty of a trial is, to see what really happened. And now we're playing scramble trying to figure out how do we cross-examine a witness without knowing what they're going to say. And 
And realistically, if this was a civil case, you can't even designate an expert unless you've provided all discovery on a month before trial. There's more protections in a civil court about money than there is in a due process when somebody's life's on the line. And that, in my mind, is disappointing, upsetting, shakes the foundation of due process. And I wish, I ask that the court enforce the discovery obligations that the court has discretion over and to say, inform the people, if you want to call an expert, disclose everything they did, have them write a report, and give it over to defense so we know what's going to happen and what's going to come up so we don't have to keep doing these 402 hearings to find out the day before they're going to testify, which then robs the defense of the right to consult with their expert thoroughly, research everything they did, see if there's anything that we can do to counteract that, see if we can fully understand what actual process that they did. I mean, realistically, we're happy to work on cross-examination on the clock. And just to reiterate and make sure we're clear, I don't think the people did anything unethical because I don't think the law requires them to actually infer knowledge based on their expert. But operating the way they are is creating a landmark of due process violations. And we stepped on one yesterday. And so I'm asking the court to use this discretion to either exclude the witness, delay the witness until they can get proper discovery to us so we know what's going on, and then we can call the witness if they find there's something relevant about it once we know what they're going to say. So yesterday at the conclusion, the witness indicated he did provide or send to the prosecution all of his materials, and we were going to make arrangements for prosecution to get that and get that to you. Has that happened yet? Yes. The email link that was sent to Mr. Imes, he forwarded to me. I started downloading it onto the server that I shared with Mr. Moline. The connection on that was slow. That was over a two-hour download, so I got to look at it this morning. I forwarded the link to my expert. He says, I will download it and see what's there. But at this point, I don't know in detail what's contained within that link. That's unfortunate. So how much time do you think you would need to prepare for that witness? I mean, we had the hearing yesterday. You have a pretty good idea of what it is he's going to say and what things he did and didn't do. I did. I don't know if what Mr. Imes forwarded to me includes the stuff about the wheelbase measurements. I thought that was something of interest. It does? Okay. So that's something that my expert's going to look at today. He will get back to me today, tell me what's in there. I would at least ask for at least one day, but it could be a week maybe. Sometime next week would probably be something at least I can catch up and figure out what's on there. But it would be difficult for me to do it today. Okay. So let me, if I may, clarify a few things for the record. That's correct. Dr. Arudin yesterday informed me for the first time that he had actually uploaded new material that he had continued working on since our last communication that I was not aware of to a shared file that he had provided previous discovery to me through. That previous discovery had been provided to Mr. McGee some time ago. I don't remember the exact date off the top of my head. It was like a week or so ago. The problem is Dr. Arudin, being the quirky mathematician genius that he is, seems to obsess and continues working despite having what appears to be completed a project, keeps working, keeps working, keeps working, trying to solve problems. So it created new data between that last dump of discovery and yesterday's hearing. Instead of trying to download it myself and copy it and burn it to a CD, I just gave Mr. McGee a link to that shared file that has all that in it. And I can, I did, was able to download it. It does have the measurement stuff that he was talking about. As to the nature of Dr. Arudin's testimony and production, 
I'm not so sure that it is susceptible to being written in a narrative type form report other than the images that he provides, the computer captures that he gives, the video overlays, the still photo overlays, is, the, is his product. That is his work product, and that has been provided. The, as to the measurements, uh, Dr. Rudin was very clear to correct Mr. McGee on what the discrepancies were and that they were within the margin of error, and was clear that it was not an exculpatory matter. Um, as to the issue with Dr. Rudin in totality, as I mentioned yesterday, the defense was provided his original work, which I believe was a three or four point comparison back several years ago. In the meantime, Dr. Rudin, as he mentioned a couple times yesterday, had a medical uh, issue that made him put this aside, that caused delay, plus the delay of the trial when he was then contacted um, prior to trial with a decision to use him. Mr. McGee had been informed by Mr. Dougherty of that intention and was provided uh, the new material based on Dr. Rudin's work that he resumed once that notification was sent. So the people have uh, attempted to timely comply with the discovery obligations. While there is no written narrative report of this process, I'm not sure how you write a narrative report as to a mathematical equation, which also is a, a lot of insight into the process to ask probing questions. Uh, had clearly consulted with his expert on that matter. I remind the court that if there has been any form of, whether intentional or unintentional, uh, violation of discovery process, that uh, exclusion of the evidence is the last remedy the court should entertain. Uh, before it gets there, it should entertain other remedies, which I think the court is alluding to, such as time, continuances, time to consult with their expert, which clearly has done that information has been shared with them. Um, so I believe that, at least for the foundational purposes, I believe the people have carried their burden to show that Dr. Rudin is relevant, offers a relevant piece of evidence for the jury to make a determination on guilt or innocence. Uh, it is obviously subject to a credibility analysis by those witnesses, or by those jurors, of the witness based on his presentation. Uh, and as for the discovery issues, if the court sees fit to uh, provide Mr. McGee uh, ample time, we have no objection to that. Um, I believe that if it goes into next week, it may cause a further delay because Dr. Rudin, I believe, is unavailable. He's out of the area presenting on his topic, and I cannot secure his presence. So it may cause a little bit of delay potentially to the 19th. So, when, when is, what time period is he going to be on? He indicated to me he has prearranged uh, travel and, commit, and professional commitments the 8th through the 15th, the eighth. which is basically all of next week. Okay. We're dark Tuesday due to the President's Day holiday, um, which leaves us the 11th, 13th, and 14th for testimony. We have plenty of other witnesses to fill that time. Okay. All right. Um, well, I think the defense had a very broad, general idea of what Dr. Rubin was going to testify to, but certainly not uh, all of the specifics and all of the details and all of the examination stated. And indeed, they just died new information basically today uh, and I think obviously the defense does need time to be able to review and detail yesterday with the new material and to consult with their their own expert prior to Dr. Rubin's testimony uh, and Realistically, I think they need more than a day to do that. Uh, so I'm willing to uh, delay Dr. Rudin's testimony to uh, February 19th. That's fine. Appreciate the court's uh, accommodation of Dr. Rudin's schedule sure. as well.
Sure. Okay. And on an unrelated note, um, I've been in conversations with uh, the people's attorneys, and one of the issues that came up was the uh, cell tower expert, Agent Bowles, that they were going to call. I understand based on scheduling, they anticipate calling him on the 13th. Our expert could not be here on the 13th, but he's available on the 14th. And we secured reservations for him to fly down. If the people are able to accommodate that, then we would ask to that be granted so he could be here and assist. I don't know what Mr. Agent Bull's uh, scheduling is or what the issues could be, but just that's just something that we just at least want to alert all the parties to. Uh, we can attempt to accommodate that again. It depends. The 13th, I did indicate to them, was a soft date um, due to the other scheduling issues, um, depending on how we, far we get through certain witnesses. Um, if we can accommodate that, we will. Um, we will look at our witnesses' schedules and availabilities and see if we can shuffle some around to accommodate that, but I can't make any guarantees. Okay. All right. I mean, we, the testimony is being filmed, so he would have the opportunity to not only review a transcript, but actually uh, um, somehow I think it would be possible to get a video of it. It's on YouTube every night. I understand it's on YouTube. I don't know how soon after the testimony. No, I, I, I mean, I, I don't know. And I know people that have tried to watch the trial live feed. It may not be the most stable for people that no, are I'm, I'm, I, I just, I don't know what his uh, ability is. I think he has another commitment for the 11th, 12th, and 13th, and that's why he couldn't be here. So I don't even know if he has the available time to watch it live, but that's... But at a minimum, uh, at a minimum, he would have a transcript of this. At a minimum, he would have a transcript and uh, the availability of any exhibits that were utilized by the expert. Obviously, yes, those transcripts usually produce the next day as well. So that's... Like I said, we'll attempt to accommodate it without guarantees to pay on the floor. If you need a little bit of time for preparation for cross, I'd be willing to give you that. Thank you. So uh, I think we can, we'll work it out one way or the other. Okay? Yes. Uh, we're ready with, obviously, Dr. Rubin's not no. seeing Mr. Doherty shaking his head. No. <laughs> we, we have some audio difficulties. Can you just give us five, ten minutes to secure that? Oh, uh, we're setting up the witness from Virginia? Yes. yes. Okay, that's fine. <laughs>
Are you familiar with the term MMA? Yes, what is an MMA? It means for Master Administrator. And in terms of QuickBooks, what does it mean if somebody is a Master Administrator? The Master Administrator uh, person knows about what exactly QuickBooks is. QuickBooks is a bookkeeping software used by businesses uh, in order to maintain proper profit and loss reporting invoices for customers, bills for your vendors, and your standard overall keeping records of your business. Thank you. Um, if somebody were to call the um, QuickBooks support line and the caller was not the master administrator of the account, how would that work? They can still ask questions about certain things with the account, how would I add an invoice, they can still get technical support for the account, but if they keep the questions on how do I remove a user or how do I cancel or delete this information, we can't give them that information as that's tied to the master administrator. Now when you take a call for customer support, do you make notes on that particular call that comes in? Yes, ma'am. And are those notes kept within the account holder's records? Yes, ma'am. Are you and other customer support personnel then able to access those notes that other support personnel make? Yes, ma'am. And when you make notes on an account, is it important to make sure that those notes are accurate? Yes, ma'am, because you always want to be able to keep an accurate record of what happened in case there is a follow-up phone call. And is there also, um, when a call comes in and a customer has a particular issue that you're going to work on, are they also signed, assigned a case ID number? Yes, ma'am. Now, if a customer would have more than one account, does the customer have to specify which account they're calling about? Yes, they would. And so, is that delineated by email address? Yes, ma'am. So, in February of 2010, can you tell us approximately how many customer support calls per day you would take? Anywhere between 25 and 50, maybe. And did you work five days a week at that time? Yes, ma'am. And now on February 9th of 2010, at approximately 8.06 a.m. Pacific time, did you receive a customer support call for Joseph McStay? Yes, ma'am. Okay. Now, given that you can't see, prior to losing your eyesight, did you have an opportunity to review the information that you had noted from this call? Yes, ma'am. Did you participate in a conference call with the detective Dan Hankey back in 2014? Yes, ma'am. And at that time when you reviewed the notes with him, did you notice any errors in any of the notes? Yes, ma'am. Did you also have an opportunity to review the emails on the account that you had sent? Yes, ma'am. And were there any errors or anything incorrect about the information that Detective Hankey went through with you? So what information, with respect to that call that came in on February 9th, what information did you gather from the caller? The caller actually gave me the name of Joseph McStay. When I asked them for their name, they gave me the name of Joseph McStay. They gave me the telephone number and the name of the business, as well as the email address. And as you sit here today, do you recall what that particular telephone number was? No, ma'am, I do not. The telephone number was recorded in an automated system, as well as he gave me a number to look up the business as well. Okay, and the telephone number that the caller used, was that recorded on the notes that you had reviewed back in 2014? Yes, ma'am. Okay, and would it refresh your memory to have somebody uh, read that telephone number to you to reflect the phone number that the caller was calling from? Uh, it, that's perfectly fine, but I, I, so many years ago, I'm not going to recollect the number itself now. Okay, but that was recorded on the actual documentation that you reviewed with Detective Hankey? Yes, ma'am. Please can pull it up for me now. Okay, and then while you're reviewing that, can you also review the email address that the caller provided you with? Yes, ma'am. 
Thank you. And uh, just so that the individual that's assisting you, if he can refer to uh, page five of the packet that he has, that information would be the phone number. Are you there? Yes, we can hear you. So is the phone number that you were just um, discussed, or someone just talked to you about, was that 909-374-0102? Yes, ma'am. And was the email address that the caller provided you custom at earthinspiredproducts.com? Yes, ma'am. And you indicated that the caller identified themselves as Joseph McStay, is that right? Yes, ma'am. If the caller had provided you with another name, would you have made a note of that? Yes. Now, based on the information that you were provided by the caller, were you able to pull up the account? Yes, ma'am, I was. And did the caller provide you a reason in terms of why they were calling customer support? They did. The caller actually advised that they wanted the account deleted from our servers and removed from our system, so all the data would be expunged from our system itself. And can you describe a little bit about the tone and tenor of the request to delete the actual information? Yeah, yeah. Just, just, just a minute. Right hold on. Hold on. Mm -hmm. We have an objection. Hold on. What's the objection? No foundation. This Overall. Okay, you can answer the question. Um, the caller was using what to remove all of the business records and the business from our system. They wanted it purged directly from our QuickBooks servers so they can have it removed altogether. And did the caller provide you with any information as to why they wanted that deleted? No, they were just very adamant that they wanted it taken off of our servers. And when you indicated that it was Joseph McStay that called you, was there anything that the caller said when they asked for the information to be deleted that led you to believe that you were talking to the master administrator on the account? When they originally called and gave me the name of Joseph McStay in the email, it matched our system to the master administrator, so I was very much under the impression that I was speaking to the master administrator of the account. Now, having been in customer support for that period of time that you had back in 2010, did the call to be appear to be unusual to you? It was very unusual, yes, ma'am. Why, why was it unusual? Um, being in my position and speaking with multiple business owners a day, um, business owners are not trying to get rid of their records. Business owners very much want to protect their data. Um, even when they are worried about other employees seeing things or having it removed for protection purposes, um, it's very, very, very highly unlikely that you get a phone call where someone is just very demanding to have it removed from the systems itself. People want to protect it, not get rid of it. In the approximately six years that you have been working for Intuit back in 2010, have you encountered that type of a request before? three or four times, but most of the time it would have to do with a, you know, another business owner or someone being not having access anymore, someone who had been fired from the business. There's usually other circumstances that they explain during that time. Now, if an account is solely online is there, and it's deleted, is there any way to retrieve the data after it's deleted? From our systems, once it's purged from the systems, if the customer does not have their own copy of the data, there is no way to retrieve it. If the caller had asked you about wanting to make a copy of that information or retaining that information, are there separate instructions that you would provide to that caller? Yes, there is. The caller actually, um, there was notes in the account from the day before of them wanting to uh, be able to use a different version of QuickBooks and how to be able to get all of that data. And there was notes listed on that from the day prior to that. 
Was that on a, the same account or a separate account? I believe it was the same account they put with another customer service representative. If they had provided the email of Joseph McStay69 at hotmail.com, can you tell us if that was the same account? It was not. It was not the master administrator email. It was not the same account for that. So it would be listed as a separate, you know, uh, a customer, a company user for the account, and it would not be a master administrator. Okay. Now, if a business owner wants to hide information, is QuickBooks password protected? Yes, ma'am. Can the password be changed? Yes, ma'am. And would you have to be the master administrator to change the password? You would have to either be the master administrator or the user where you could receive the password change email. Okay. Now, you indicated that um, once that information is purged, you can no longer retrieve it from QuickBooks. Um, if the caller had asked you and informed you that they wanted to retain data, would you have put that in your notes? Yes, I would. Now, if a caller calls you and requests to delete the entire account, does that happen automatically when they call you? No, that's not something we will do. Um, it has to actually be the master administrator, and there are information that they have to provide for us. I would have sent them an email with specific information requested, and I would not have been able to delete the information until I received those emails back. Okay, so there's additional steps that have to be followed in order for that to occur, is that right? Yes, ma'am. So someone calls you and indicates that they are Joseph McStay and they want to delete their account. What was the next step that you took? Um, the next step that I took was that I told them that I was going to send them an email, that they needed to fill out the email and send it back to me, and then we would start the process of removing the information from the servers. And would that, info, would that email have been sent to the custom at earthinspiredproducts.com account? Yes, ma'am. And can you tell us essentially what the email says that you send out? The email is basically just a, a small protection to say, you know, if you can please fill out this email that says, I, my name, or you would fill in your own name, you hereby get permission for QuickBooks to delete all the information for business name. You send that first email out right after you talked with uh, Mr. Who you believe to be Mr. McStay. I did, yes, ma'am. And did you receive any response? No, ma'am. Did you follow up after you did not receive a response to that email? I did, yes, ma'am. And what does the second email you sent say, essentially? Essentially, the second email is a follow-up. I haven't heard anything from you. Do you need any other information? Please let me know. And did you receive a response from that email? I did not, know it. Did you then send a third email? I did, yes, ma'am. And do you recall when that email was sent? A uh, few days later, um, usually three or four days, and we don't hear any contact. We'll send a final email saying, hey, listen, I haven't heard anything back from you. I'm going to go ahead and close this case. But if you do have any other questions, by all means, feel free to get in touch. Okay, and as I asked you prior to, do you recall telling Detective Hankey, because you indicated to us that you had reviewed a call from the day before where somebody attempted to order a new version of QuickBooks. Do you recall testifying to that? Um, I did, yes, Okay, well, you talked about a phone call that was made the day before. Do you remember that? I do, but I'm not... When you looked at the custom at earthinspiredproducts.com account, are you, are you able to review any particular notes or um, any other prior calls that are made to customer service when you open that account? Yes, ma'am. And do you recall if you saw any particular emails 
or calls for, or, I'm sorry, any notes or calls for service related to the custom at earthinspiredproducts.com email. Do you recall when you were interviewed by Detective Hankey um, telling him that you were not aware of any other purchases for QuickBooks on that account? Uh, I do remember, yes, ma'am. Okay. So if somebody else had ordered a new version of QuickBooks on the Joseph McStay 69 at hotmail.com, would that information populate over to the custom at earthinspiredproducts.com account? No, man, it would not because it's, the account itself is a purchase of another version of QuickBooks. <laughs> the purchase of the program is not associated to the business records. Okay. They can purchase another version or another subscription with another email or anything like that. Or, you know, walk into a store. Okay. A and do you recall what any, um, is, there, is there a set line that QuickBooks uses for customer service calls? There was. Uh, there's an 800 number. Do you remember what that was? I do not. And we've changed them so many times over the years. Okay. Just one moment. <laughs> I have nothing further at this time, Your Honor. Thank you, Your Honor. Did you want to switch seats, Raj, so we can see you? Well, Not see you, but <laughs> see you here. Sorry. <laughs> Good morning, Mr. Baker. How are you? I'm very well yourself. So it's uh, it's actually afternoon now, correct? Yes, sir. Okay. Um, I want to ask you a couple questions about uh, first of all the the actual call itself. You get 25 to 50 calls per day, is that correct? About yes, sir. And when you talk to Detective Hankey uh, way back in 2014, you indicated to him that. You didn't specifically remember the call because you get so many calls per day, but that you had made some notes on your uh, screen at the time that kind of refreshed your re recollection about it. Do you remember telling him that? Yes, sir. And how long was the phone call? Do your notes on the computer screen give us an idea of how long the phone call was, the total time? I would say maybe 10 to 15 minutes. So on the... Sure. sure. The, the times that you would put on your computer screen... And I had to blow these up because they were so small, but let's see. Uh, yeah, it's, um, I'm going to do my handy dandy light here. Okay, I'm looking at uh, slide 7, which would be exhibit E12. So, And I know that, uh, I don't know if you have these there. Or... I sent them over, but it's not even number. It's just number by the slide. The slide number. So uh, if somebody's there uh, assisting you, Mr. Baker, there's <clears throat> a slide number seven. Okay. Um, actually, that's not the correct slide, though. <laughs> that is not the right slide. Let's see. I'm looking. I'm trying to look for the first because there's multiple slides during the phone call, correct? Um, there's that tool that we used back then was really two screens. I mean, maybe what I saw when I was entering the was mainly two screens. Okay, but in terms of um, the, the Actually, these, these actual computer uh, slides from the screen were, were reproduced by you, correct? And then you turned them over to uh, Detective Hankey? These were our screenshots of the account, yes, sir. 
And you're the one that took the screenshots, correct? I took some of them. I did not take them all. Gotcha. Okay, so I'm looking at uh, a screen number 10. So I don't know if somebody there is assisting you if they have that number there. Yeah. Okay, and at the bottom there, it indicates Ryan Baker, the time of the call, I guess, is 8.06 a.m., is that correct? Right? Yes, sir. And then it says 8.06 a.m. to 2.9, a.m., is that correct? Yes, sir. Does that reflect the duration of the call? And do you, do you have an independent recollection of how long this call was? Uh, probably about 10 to 15 minutes, but I cannot give you an exact number, no, sir. Okay. Now, these phone calls are recorded, correct? No, sir, they were not recorded back then. Okay, I'm going to um, show you a... Um, actually, I can't show it to you, but I don't know how we're going to do this, but it's a... Um, uh, you were hired in 2004, correct? Yes, sir. And you had to sign some documents uh, in 2004 regarding your employment with Intuit, correct? Uh, what, what form do you ask me about? Well, there was one thing that they had you sign called the Telephone Screen Capture Monitoring and Recording Software document. Okay. I don't remember if I signed that or not. Okay, I'm going to try and... Uh, I'm sure I did. <laughs> Well, I'm going I'm to show it to uh, the person assisting you. And we have a mark that exhibit 807. Sure. So I'm going to, uh, uh, I guess I'll show it to whoever's well, assisting you. <coughs> you have to the close. It's for the person there. Uh, and whoever's there, they, they, they can tell me if they can see this. I can read into it, telephone screen capture. Um, it's, the paragraph is really not clear enough to read. Gotcha. So I'll read it for you. And if I and if I don't get it right, I'm sure Ms. Rodriguez will correct me on uh, your redirect. So it says here in this document, I'm going to go to the second page first, and I'm going to show you a signature line. And I know that the person assisting you probably doesn't know your signature, but is there a name there, uh, sir, that you can recognize where it says Ryan Baker? Uh, I'll stipulate that it says Ryan Baker. Ryan Baker, 11104. Uh, yes. Yeah. And do you remember, Mr. Baker, that's about the time you were hired, November 1st, 2004? Yes, sir. So this is six years prior to uh, uh, the phone call, correct, or five and a half years? Okay, so on the first page of that, uh, under the second, um, under the second uh, uh, paragraph, it indicates the system is activating, meaning the call recording capture software uh, that is activated when a one eight hundred number is called and is answered. That the system is activated any time a call is received on a customer support toll free number. This would include any personal calls. Uh, that come in to the toll-free number. And you indicated that this call came in on a toll-free number, correct? And then it goes on in paragraph four. Once activated, the software will record the audio portion of the telephone call until the call is disconnected. And I'm going to put it up there so maybe the person assisting you can see that paragraph. See that the, the, the first letter being once? Yes. Okay. What's visible on the screen is once activated, the software will record the on audio portion of uh, I you have to move it to your right. Audio portion of the tele 
that's good enough. So, you recall that, right? That's in 2004. Okay, so this was in 2010. So is it your testimony that in 2010 they hadn't yet activated an audio uh, recording device for these incoming calls? Objection, argument. Ooh. <laughs> And you, you, you knew that these were recorded because you mentioned it in your, in your interview with Detective Hankey. You mentioned that these calls were recorded. You recall that? Calls are recorded from time to time, yes, sir. Okay. All of them are recorded. In fact, you don't even have a choice. When you pick up a call, it gets recorded, and you have no way of disengaging the recording feature. Is that correct, Mr. Baker? Objection, argument, since that's not in evidence. The, the, objection, the objection sustained is argumentative. If there was an answer, it's uh, stricken. Mr. Baker, you worked in a customer support service role for how many years? Um, about 15. 15 years. And you even, super, you even supervised and trained newer customer support people, correct? Correct. And is it your testimony that you're unaware of how the uh, customer support audio recording uh, mechanism works? Objection, Wait, 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 wait. wait. The objection sustained. Hold on, hold on, hold on. The objection sustained that uh, is assuming that's not in evidence. Did you strike the answer, Your Honor? If there was an answer, it's stricken. In your years as a customer support, uh, service person, do you know whether or not Intuit has a audio recording system for tele inbound telephone calls? Yes, sir. Okay. And what is the criteria for the recording device to be activated? Is the recording device and uh, that is uh, used with uh, the inbound support um, the inbound support uh, request from customers, is that something that um, is used as a training tool for, for newer uh, or more less experienced uh, customer support personnel? Are you speaking today or six years ago? In 2010. Let's start with 2010. In 2010, there was, we did not train on that, no, sir. So, before your interview with Detective Hankey, Detective Hankey uh, talked to somebody else in the legal department, is that correct? Yes, sir. And Ms. Rodriguez, when she was talking to you, she mentioned a conference call, correct? Yes, sir. That interview with Detective Hankey was actually a conference call with somebody from your legal services department on the phone with you guys, correct? Yes, sir. And you got advance notice of the nature and purpose of the uh, upcoming interview with Detective Hankey, correct? Yes, sir. And so Detective Hankey had told your legal department about the case, correct? Objection, hearsay. Sustained. You knew about the you knew about the nature of the case, is that correct? I knew about the case, not the nature. And you actually did your own reading about the case prior to the interview, correct? Uh, yes, sir. Okay, so even when you talked to Detective Hankey, both of you talked about how important your role would be in testifying. You remember that? Objection. Are you ready? And oh, overrule the answer. Is that right? Uh, can you repeat the question? Yes. Uh, you and Detective Hankey had a conversation about how important your testimony would be, correct? Well, I'm asking you, did you and Detective Hank have a question about how important it would be for you, for your, uh, for your testimony in this case? Um, yes, sir. Okay. And you told him you wanted to do a good job, right? I told him I wanted to be honest. Okay. Now, let me ask you this. When a call comes in to the customer support line, you're supposed to get a history of what's happening with that customer uh, is that correct? Like, in other words, if there's a call to delete information, like you, 
you got a call in this uh, in this case to have something deleted. Now, would you have the previous uh, request from the customer also up on your screen? Okay. So you don't know what happened the day before when you were having this phone call. Is that correct? That's correct. Now you got a chance to review the day before's phone call, correct? That's correct. Yes, sir. And that was a request from the same number, but to a different customer support person, correct? That was a different support person, yes, sir. And his name was Sean Augustine, correct? That's correct. And the request that was made. For, from, for Sean Augustine was to transfer the existing account, which was online, correct, to QuickBooks Pro, which is a desktop version of QuickBooks. Objection here, sir, since that's not in evidence. Overall, he can answer uh, based on the business records. <laughs> Mr. Baker, is that correct? Yes, sir, that's correct. Okay, so. The transfer from online to desktop is a pretty normal thing that occurs, is that correct? Yes, sir, that's correct. And the online version is a su subscription-based uh, fee structure, correct? Yes, sir, that's correct. So every month when I, when I have QuickBooks online, I have to pay $25 per month, correct? No. Back in 2010. Okay. So if I want to transfer that to QuickBooks Pro, which is just on my desktop in front of me, then I can do that, and I can still have all the data that's online exported to my uh, QuickBooks desktop, correct? That's correct, yes, sir. And so, let's say, for example, you talked about business partners and reasons for deleting. Let's say I have a business partner that is able to hack into my account, all right? And I want to get rid of that ability for that business partner to be able to hack into my online account. So I decide that I want to switch it to QuickBooks Pro, which is a desktop version, so that that person can't hack in anymore. And I would be able to uh, call up QuickBooks and then uh, request that that export that that information on online would be exported to my desktop. I could do that, correct? Objection. Yeah. Improper hypothetical. Yeah. Assume facts and like evidence. Objection sustained. I move to strike the answer. If there was any answer, it's stricken. If I want to transfer my data to, from online to the desktop version, I can have instructions on exporting it. Uh, to my desktop, correct? Yes, sir. In fact, when you transfer from online to desktop, you have to export the data, correct? correct, yes, sir. And let me ask you this, Mr. Baker. What happens to the data? Once it's exported to the desktop, what happens to the data that's floating in cyberspace with the online version? It gets removed anyway, correct? Yes, sir. Okay. So, and when people do make that transfer from online to desktop, they ask for instructions on how to delete it. In fact, the QuickBooks software gives them the instructions on how to delete, correct? Yes, sir. Because obviously it's being, it's being um, converted from an online account to a desktop, correct? But you only keep that for 90 days as a precaution, and then it's deleted by you guys anyway, correct? Yes, sir. All right. So, this, I just want to be clear on what this call was all about on the 9th that you got. You had no information that the call before was a request to transfer from the online to the uh, desktop, correct? You didn't know that when you were make, having this phone call on the 9th, correct? So somebody calling on the 9th asking for the information on how to delete the online account and nothing more, that would seem strange, correct? But that's not what they asked me, so they didn't ask me how to do it. They told me they needed it removed from our system. That's two different things. Okay, well, I'm not a QuickBook 
pro aficionado. I, don't, I wouldn't know the terminology. I'm sure customers use all kinds of terminology that may be different than a QuickBooks expert like yourself, correct? Objection argumentative. Well, I mean, lay people speak in different terms, correct? Objection vague. <laughs> you get calls and you get requests from, from customers who don't are not very computer uh, savvy and they'll ask a question. It's your job to decipher what the what the meaning is and what they want, correct? That's part of your, your job. I'm not sure how to answer that question. Um, um, when people need help, I'm there, but I'm not there to tell them that they're not doing it properly or anything of that nature. It sounds, I'm not sure how to answer that question. Well, I, I guess my question is, when you call, when you get customer calls from quick, you know, from people uh, asking all kinds of different questions, sometimes they may not be using the correct uh, computer terminology or QuickBook terminology, they just have a problem they want to fix, right? Correct. And when you're speaking of exporting and deleting, those are two different things. Correct. And the, when you reviewed the call from the day before, the request was to Sean uh, Hennessy was to uh, uh, sorry, Augustine, sorry, wants to transfer data from QuickBooks online to QuickBook Pro to 10, 2010 need help. That was I know, but that's what, that was from from the day before, correct? Yes, sir. Okay, and and you already indicated that you didn't have that information, correct? That's correct. And the next step after that transfer was to take place, then a customer would have to delete the online um, data, correct? Once the transfer takes place, they just they click on a link to cancel the subscription. In fact, those are. I'm sorry. Go ahead. The person just told me they wanted it deleted. Gotcha. So now, um, when the call is made to you on the ninth, the request is not to delete information. It's on how to delete the QuickBooks online. Um, uh, data, correct? Objection to the state's testimony. System. The request, what, what you get on the ninth is a request for information. Is that correct? No, what I got on the ninth was a request the person telling me on the other end of the phone that they needed to have the QuickBooks information purged and removed and deleted from our QuickBooks system. They were very adamant to remove it all from our system. Gotcha. But you don't write purged on your notes anywhere. Why, why, and you didn't mention that to Detective um, Hanky. You, is that a, a word that you just use now? Objection, argue that. Yeah. Okay, let me ask you this. When, um, when you, let's see, on, on the night when you got the call, the only thing that you do, though, is you respond with instructions on how to do these things, correct? I responded telling him it can't be done until I received certain information back from him via email. Right, because you, in order to to uh, do any deleting or even transporting or, or exporting data or anything, you have to send instructions, and then that person has to either click on a link or follow the instructions to uh, to get the the issue resolved. Correct. Correct. All right, and in this case, that's what you did. The customer asked for something, and then you sent off instructions, correct? Correct. And you indicated that there was no reply to the instructions, correct? That's correct. So nothing got done, is that correct? That's correct. Nothing was deleted, correct? In fact, even the day before, the, the information on how to export data from online to the QuickBooks Pros, that was never followed through, and that, that was never uh, completed either, correct? I was not a part of that case that was handled by another agent. So at the, end of the day, at the end of the day, you sent off instructions on how to do something, and those instructions were never replied to, correct? Correct. And no one ever deleted anything, correct? Correct. All right. Let me ask... I'm going to show you. A, a, I'm going to show the person that's assisting you a couple of documents. I 
I don't know what to call you, sir. I guess I'll call you Mr. Assistant. Can you see this? Um, I can see boxes, but I'm not going to be able to read what looks like an email address. Um, uh, it's just not clear enough on this end. Um, Hold on, let me see if I can... Uh, does QuickBooks always print things so small? I mean... <laughs> It says back end user information. Does that does that ring a bell? Yes, sir. And what does back end user information mean? Back end stands for back end the company data, the list of you know how many customers they have, how many vendors they have. It's the hard uh, data of the company itself. Okay. So you had mentioned that the person used an email of custom uh, with the word custom in it, correct? Now, were you aware that the, um, this particular uh, business had two separate QuickBook accounts? I was not aware at the time, no, sir. Okay. But you have since become aware, correct? Yes, sir. And the, the other... Um, there was a, the other um, account... Instead of custom in their email, they have a, a word called contact, correct? I'm sorry, did you hear me the, the other QuickBooks account um, has a an email address. Instead of custom, it, it would say contact, correct? Objection Foundation. Oh, he can answer if he knows. I'm not sure. Okay. The other, the custom account that you referred to was a much newer account and went back only a couple years in 2008 as opposed to the other one that we looked at, correct? Objection, foundation. Again, no, I overruled the answer if he knows. I didn't, I don't know, I didn't look at the other one. Oh, you didn't look at the other account at all? I didn't look at the one, I got the phone call regarding. Okay, well when you get a call you actually do a search when you get the person's name, correct? Or the name on the account. And when you did a search in this case, um, I'm going to show you uh, slide six. If the person there can pull out slide six. And at the top of it, it's a computer screen and it says customer search. That would be a screen that indicates you put in a name, you do a search of all the accounts that that person is associated with, correct? Um, I don't, I'm not using that search engine. Oh, you don't use that one? No, that you can see that there's nothing in those fields, sir. Yeah, we don't use that. Well, there's, there's a customer name, Joseph McStay. That's what's populated when I type that in, but I'm not searching anything beyond that. I'm putting in notes for the case that I'm working on the customer at the time. That's just another window if I wanted to search something separately. Okay, so this particular screen has four different uh, Joseph McStays, and it looks like it's divided into two separate accounts. Is that what you got? Is that what you were? Um, is that what you got? I mean, is that the information you got when you uh, were working on this problem on the night? Yes, yes, sir. Okay, so you knew at the time that there were two separate accounts, correct? No, sir. Okay. How so? If this screen came up with four different Joseph McStay uh, uh, names divided into two accounts, how did you not know there was more than one account? Because, again, sir, this isn't the screen that I'm typing in the customer information in. This is the screen that's populated with all the information associated with Joseph McStay. That's not the information I was typing anything in, so I'm not, I'm not reading that at the same time I'm documenting what I'm hearing from the person on the phone. There's two separate screens, I'm not reading and documenting at the same time. But the purpose of the screen is to, to give the view of the, the person that's assisting the customer all the different accounts that that person may be associated with, correct? Objection, argumentative. Ooh, 
Is that correct? Uh, your question's not making any sense. Okay. I can't answer it, I'm sorry. All right, well, the first, well, well you, you, you have a customer search field here, correct? What you're looking at, yes, but again, this is not what I was typing in when I was on the phone with the customer. I understand that. I understand that you didn't type it in. What I'm asking sure. you is some, you must have pressed a button that did a search because four names of Joseph McState came up, correct? Jackson, are you met it? Sustained also since that's not your How did the four names of Joseph McState come up? Objection. Misstate's testimony. Who will answer? I don't know. Okay. Now, you can see that the custom part, the top two names, have over on the right, uh, over on the right hand side, and this is slide six from Mr. Assistant. Tell us when you see it. Okay, I see it, but that's not a screen I had any privy to. That's just a, a history screen. Okay, but you, you 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 recognize that what that is, correct? I do recognize the screen, but that's not a screen I use. No, sir. Okay, but you see over towards the right, it says last case last case closed. Do you, do you see that, uh, Mr. Assistant? Yeah. Okay, so. I'm sorry, just a moment. Is the assistant speaking or is it? Uh, uh, okay, so I'll do that question again. Uh, this is for this is for Mr. Assistant. Last case closed. So it's the uh, one, two, three, four, five, six column over on the right. Can you object as a foundation with this slide, Your Honor. Oh, well, we can testify to the as a business record. Mr. Assistant, tell us when you, when you find that. Yeah, last case closed. Okay. Now, the first Joseph McStay of the four pertains to an email uh, that, is, that references the custom account. Do you see that, Mr. Assistant? Yeah. Okay, and what date does it have where it says last case closed? 2, 13, 2010, 9.54 a.m. Okay, and the next one down, which is also uh, the custom, is what is the last case closed there? Uh, I'm gonna object that this takes the information well, I mean, you're, you're having, now you're asking an unsworn witness to read material. Uh, well, he's, he's, it, it goes to recollect a refreshing Well, story. if you want the assistant to read the information to the witness, so the witness can answer any questions you have about it, you can do that. That's fine. If you could uh, please read that to Mr. Baker. Okay, so those two, those two um, entries, 213, Mr. Baker, that would be an indication of when customer support or somebody dealt with that account from QuickBooks, correct? I'm going to the that team number, not the account itself, that particular team number. Hold on, hold on. Overall, the end, we can answer. Okay, now you go ahead. Now, let me go to the to the, the bottom two accounts. Uh, Mr. Assistant, if you could read to Mr. Baker the last case close dates for the last two uh, uh, entries there that deal with the other account. 11, 14, 2007, 11, 17 a.m., 11, 14, 2007, 11, 17. So, Mr. Baker, would that indicate that on those two accounts, nobody had requested any assistance from QuickBooks since 2007? Uh, that would not actually state that, no. It would just state that about the case itself. They would have had multiple cases, but that particular case was closed. Okay. Well, this is, if you look at the top, 
of, the, of that screening. This, this is not a, um, a case-specific screen. This is a customer screen, correct? What do you mean by customer screen? Meaning it's all the accounts for the customer. Um, I can't answer that question because we don't have that tool anymore. That tool has been done for too many years, and I can't tell you if that's everything or not. No, sir. Okay. And so you don't know, and, and there's no... Uh, yes, sir. Okay. And there's nothing on this screen that indicates that this pertains to that case, correct? Not that I see on the screen, no, sir. Okay. When you took the call from uh, Detective Hankey and we were on a conference call back in 2014, um, I think it was October 24th, correct? Uh, I would be glad to believe you, sir. And you didn't have any of the screens in front of you when you were talking to Detective Hankey, is that accurate? No, sir, I was taking my son's sugar tree. Right. And um, after your conversation with Detective Hankey, were you able to go back and look at your screens? Because you printed them out, right? Yes, sir. So you were able to look at all of them? Uh, very quickly, yes, sir. Okay. And so I you cannot read it because I just printed them out for the necessary So you didn't get yourself familiar with, with, with those screens? Not all of them, yes, sir. Okay. Um, what about uh, Mr. Augustine's screens? Did you print his screens out as well? Yes, sir. Okay. Just, uh, hold on one second, Mr. Baker. Mr. Baker? Yes, sir. I hope uh, your uh, procedure goes well. Thank you very much. Oh, thank you. You too, sir. Have a wonderful day. Just a minute. Uh, anything else, Mr. Rodriguez? Yes. Uh, Mr. Baker, you indicated that you have reviewed a message or some um, notes regarding a call on the 8th. Do you recall that? Yes, ma'am. Do you have any information that a transfer actually took place of the data on the 8th? Yes, ma'am. And were you able to determine from the email that you read whether a disk was actually sent out for QuickBooks on the 8th? Okay. Knowing that a phone call came in for a transfer of data on the 8th, and then still receiving that phone call on the 9th, asking for a deletion of data, do you still find that call to be unusual on the 9th? Yes, ma'am, very. Why? Most business owners, if you want to have their data anywhere in the cloud or anywhere like that, they need to realize their management. Um, they don't want anything to happen to their data. What if something goes wrong? What's my contingency? What's my backup? What's my backup of a backup? Is this my company information? Is my livelihood? Um, that's what most people tend to, to think about it and we perceive off in their phone call. Now, if somebody puts a desktop version on, there's also the ability to access that online. Is that correct? That is correct, yes, ma'am. And you indicated that um, you would, I, I know there was a good deal amount of time spent on a particular slide with all of uh, Mr. McStay's accounts, but the notes that you made and the information that you made for that caller had the specific email address of custom at earthinspiredproducts.com. Is that correct? Yes, ma'am. And the caller indicated to you that he was Joseph McSay, correct? Yes, ma'am. And in terms of the data, I don't think you got to finish your answer, but you indicated there was a difference between exporting data and deleting data. Can you explain what you meant by that? Yeah, the data can be exported once a day, twice a day, as many times as they want to export a copy of the data, they can export it at any time they wish to. But in order to actually remove the data, the company file has to be deleted, canceled, meaning the subscription has to be terminated, and then the data has to be deleted from the system.
and the call on the 8th, I know that you didn't take that call, but you indicated that that was a different email address that was used because it didn't show up on the notes when you reviewed them on the custom side. Is that correct? There's actually no foundation. Overall, you didn't get an answer based on the business records. That is correct. I have nothing further, Your Honor. Anything else, Mr. Wood? Yeah, unfortunately. Mr. Baker, uh, what account was was the phone call made on the 8th about? What account did it pertain to? I, I wasn't on the call. I don't, I don't recall. So how do you know it wasn't the same account that you were dealing with? It was a different email address I was dealing with. How do you know? Just a minute. Okay. The objection was overruled. The question was how do you know it was a different email address? Okay, so on 
this, well, let's just say that <coughs> uh, I'm going to go to the date of February 8th. And you said that you reviewed that information, correct? Objection to state's testimony in terms of vague of which documents. Well, sustained as vague as the time. You reviewed the February February 8th transaction, those computer screens. That's with your testimony, right, Mr. Baker? Yes, sir. Okay. So on this account, um, I'm going to put a little uh, arrow here on February 8th. I'm going to have Mr. Assistant take a look at that and see if he can see what I'm marking. Um, Hold on. There's a... How many turns does it take to plug in a computer? <laughs> okay. Um, do you see that, Mr. Assistant? Yes. Okay. So this this back end billing information, back end user information document, does it have two entries on February eighth? Can you can you read that to uh, Mr. Baker, please, the best you can? One seven zero eight fourteen fifty four seventeen TST twenty ten. In the second line, one seven zero eight fourteen forty four twenty three TST twenty ten. And what is that, Mr. Baker? Okay. Does that reflect that there was some transaction or some call from the customer to the folks on that date? I'm not sure, sir. Okay. <clears throat> Just want to clarify something. When you, I know it's been it a long time ago, Mr. Baker, 2014 is when you were interviewed by Detective Hankey. At that time, do you recall whether or not you were familiar with the 2008 transactions? I'm sorry, the uh, February 8th transactions. I'm not sure. Okay. Do you recall telling Detective Hankey that you were that there were no prior transactions on that date? Objection to state testimony. <laughs> Okay, I'm going to read you a question and answer from that from that time. Okay, can you tell me if this if this refreshes your memory? Question by Detective Hankey: uh, Were you aware of any other purchases for QuickBooks at all prior to this? <clears throat> your answer: There were there was none. I do recall that. Yes. Okay. So what were you referring to when you answered that? If you recall. Were you aware of any other purchases for QuickBooks at all prior to this date? No, sir. Okay. Um, but you were, you don't know if you were aware of the prior days, uh, the day before, you know, on, on February 8th, whether there was any transactions done on that date? I don't, I don't know if the person, if the person on the purchased anything or not. Okay. No, what I'm asking you, I guess, is confusing, I apologize. On the 14th, you're being interviewed about your call on February 9, 2010, right? Correct. And Detective Hankey asks you, were you aware of any other purchases for QuickBooks at all prior to this, meaning your February 9th conversation? Correct. And you said there was none. I was not aware of any other purchases. Okay, so you, were, you, weren't, you didn't think Detective Hankey's question pertain to any other transactions at all, or you were just thinking about purchases? I would have answer the question again today. Gotcha. All right. I'm not sure what you, what you mean, but you would ask me if there was any other, if I was aware of any other conversations about it, then I would have still said no. But purchases, I also know. No, sir. And you don't remember right now whether you were aware, when you were interviewed by Detective Hankey, whether you knew um, there was this prior uh, conversation on the 8th 
one day prior to your conversation with the with the customer? I believe before I spoke with the executive, I was aware, but I did not know any specifics or anything of that nature. And you didn't know whether it was a transfer uh, from a request for help on a transfer from QuickBooks Online to QuickBooks Pro. You didn't know those specifics, correct? Okay. I think that's it. I may see you again. You know, uh, we'll see. Just going to leave these in your You were not aware of any other purchases because there were no other purchases that showed up on the custom side of the account. Is that correct? That's correct. I don't have anything further. Mm -hmm. So, uh, uh, Mr. Baker, why the district attorney's office would call you as a witness and not Mr. Augustine also? Objection, improper argument. <laughs> Mr. Baker, if you know, how many different um, account, uh, how many different users can you have for a particular account? Objection, the honest scope. Sustained, also sustained on relevancy grounds. Can you have more than one email associated with an account? Objection, the honest scope. Oh, sorry. Yeah, I'm going to have a reader too, Mr. Mm -hmm. Assistant. Okay. okay. Can you have different accounts? Um, for one, for one account, for one QuickBooks account. Objection beyond the scope. Sustained, also sustained this day. Yes, about the custom account. Mm -hmm. yes. The objection sustained, yes. the scope of this witness's testimony relates to the February 9th phone call and possibly the February 8th information. Okay, just to clarify so we don't end up confusing you. Uh, an account has an email associated to it, correct? Objection, the honest folks. And uh, on that ground, the cumulative. It's not going to work, Mr. Baker. Good luck tomorrow. Mr. Baker, I wanted to clarify one or two questions, which unfortunately will probably give the attorneys more questions. But uh, the phone call that you got on February the 9th, was the request was the caller requesting you to delete the account information, or was the caller requesting information on how the caller could delete the information? He requested me to delete the information. Okay, and then you sent an email. Actually, you sent a total of three emails requesting additional information for you to act upon that request. Is that correct? That is correct, sir. And if you had received that information, then the next step would have been for you to go ahead and fulfill the request and delete the information. Is that correct? That is correct, sir. Okay. The emails that you sent to the caller uh, were those directions on how the caller could delete the information or just requesting follow-up information to enable you to delete the information? It was a request for formal permission for us to be able to delete it from our servers. Okay. So when the caller called in on February the 9th, and he gives you the name, and he gives you the email, custom at earthinspiredproducts.com. You put that into a computer, correct? That is correct. All right. And when you put that in, what comes up on your screen? When you put that in, if you press the search button, the business pops up, and you just type in your notes. Okay. Um, if 
that same customer had called the day before using the same name, same phone number, same email, custom at earthingspottedproducts.com with a different request, would that have popped up on your screen on the February 9th call? But that did not happen on your February 9th call, is that right? That is correct, that did not happen. Okay. Anything further? No, no. Yes. So, uh, Mr. Baker, based on the, the judge's question, there is an email associated with an account, is that correct? Yes, sir. Okay. Now, is it your... As the, as the uh, support person, is it you that decides to plug in that email and, and do a search that way for the account? Yes, sir. And there's another way to do a search by putting in the, the MMA's number, the master administrator's number, correct? A uh, name, I should say. Email. Not email. Okay. So, in, the, in that custom search screen that uh, was read to you earlier on slide number six, where it says, Joseph McStay, customer search. Objection asked and answered. She's being just too Okay. She's the plate printed on the screen. Gotcha. Uh, that's enough, that information. Uh, uh, just a minute. What was your last last answer? The search button is just the plate printed on the search button on the screen. It, it wasn't associated with one line item. Okay. I'm going to have you just take a look at slide number six, if you could. I would object this beyond the scope, Your Honor. It goes right to the court's question. I'm going to just, he said he certified, he said he certified. I'm going to counsel's testifying argument with the court. I'm going to his comments for that. Um, you kind of look at slide six three or four times. Well, it goes right to your question, Your Honor. So slide number six. Do you, do you uh, see that? Yeah. Okay. Now the, the field that I would be the field that I refer to is this customer search field that has different things that the customer support person can put into it, correct? Objection, Ms. State's testimony. Well, we're going to be financial this correct. Uh, I'll answer again. This is not the same box that a customer that the customer support agent gets. This is just a, a search engine for the back end of the information. This is not what the me as the customer representative spoke and saw earlier. Is this is this an option are these fields options that the customer support personnel can type in to do a search? Not on this screen, no. Then what what screen does this, why would this screen be, uh, why did you provide this screen to the district attorney's office? Objection, are you in there? Sustain a relevancy rounds and uh, a few of All right, so there's a, there's a box in here that has a search for email. Do you see that, Mr. Assistant? Objection relevance. Sustained is cumulative. Do you see the word optional next to the email search? Objection relevance, Ms. State's testimony. Sustained. He indicated this is not the screen that he utilized during the February 9th call. So it's not relevant to his testimony on the February 9th call. Thank you. Anything else? Any objection, Mr. Baker, being excused? No. Thank you, Mr. Baker, for your attendance. Uh, we appreciate it and hope everything goes well with your surgery. Thank you very much. You guys have a wonderful day. You too. Uh, we'll go ahead and take our uh, morning recess. We, you have another witness here for this morning? Yes, sir. All right, we'll take our morning recess 15 minutes. Keep in mind the admonitions previously given to you. Not to form or express any opinions about the case, not to discuss the case, 
Again, that we've not discussed yet enough the case. Witnesses, testimony, exhibits, parties, or attorneys. We'll see everyone back in the room.